you have your Bibles, open them up to uh, Romans chapter number 5. Romans chapter number 5. As soon as I get to Romans chapter 5. Thank you for coming today. Pray that God will bless you. Um, hopefully y'all got here in the, in the dry. It started raining pretty quickly afterwards. Uh, maybe I'll preach long enough that it'll be dry when we, when we, no, no, maybe I'll not do that, right? I'll try to, I'll try to, if I, if I hear a break in the rain, maybe I'll just say amen real quick and we'll run for the door, all right? Amen. I knew I'd get an amen sooner or later, Brother Jack. <clears throat> there are many questions today about uh, life, and about the meaning of life, the purpose of life, and, and what we can do and how we can honor God. Some people even say, is there a God? Uh, they want to know. Uh, uh, they, they, there's plenty of people that have all these kind of scenarios, and they say, well, I don't believe this, or I don't believe that, or, or if there were a God, why would this happen, or why would that happen? But most definitely, there is a God. I mean, you just look at the, the things of nature that's around us, and you can see the mighty handiwork of God. We just came through winter when everything looked like it died off. But my goodness, Mark's right. The pollen is out there, and things are blooming, and things are coming up. And, and, and it just shows you the cycle's always going. I love new life. Amen? I love to see new things coming, and in the summer it'll be a we'll have all those crops again. And I, I did some bush hogging this week and Lynn said, uh, are we going to plant a garden? And I'm thinking, ah, I don't know if we are or not. I love to plant. I love to watch it grow. And I love to watch her pig. Amen. That's always a good thing. I love to, I love to eat her cooking, uh, but, but the things of life just continue to go on. And we're grateful that God keeps all these things wonderfully well. The God of all. We, how can this happen if without, without the power in the hand of a loving God? How could all of this exist? Is this by chance? No. No. This is the orchestration of a God of love. And here's the question. If there is a God, and there is, and if he's a holy and just God, what's he going to do with sinners like us? I mean, the Bible says that there is none righteous, no, not one, that all have sinned and come short, short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death, separation from God. So if there's a God, and there is, and there is such a thing as sin, and I've seen it, you've seen it, we've experienced it, we've done it, then what's God going to do? How's God going to deal with this? Can I, can I ask y'all a question? I'm going to let, really, I want you to tell me, what would you do if you were God about man and our sin? I mean, if, if you were the sovereign one, if you were the God of all, and you've got a creation, man, that chose another way, that chose to, to, to fall into sin and to follow sin, and to repeat sin, what would you do? Some may say, well, I'll, I'll just ignore it. Can't do that. He's a just God. It still remains. I mean, if he's a just God, he can't just say, well, I'll just turn my head as if it never happened. It did happen. It does happen. Just sticking your head in the sand and saying, well, I'm just going to act like it never happened. No, that, that's not going to do anything. You may say, well, if I were God, I would judge it. That would be your right. Because we are guilty. We have sinned. It is, we deserve the punishment. But then God loves us and God wants a relationship with us. So he can't ignore it. And if he judged it, we'd be in trouble. You say, well, then I would forgive it. And I would say to you, at what price? At what price? Now, <clears throat> we don't, when we forgive something, it's still there. Someone does something to you and it hurts and there's pain, 
and you look at them and say, well, I, I forgive you. Well, that's good on your part. But it's still there. The act is still there. The damage is still there. If there's a tsunami, y'all know what a tsunami is? If there's this huge tidal wave of, of the punishment of sin, you can't just go out there and say, I ignore you. That's not going to help. You, can, you can't just go out there and say, it's wrong. Stop. No, it's coming. Well, I, I, I just forgive it. Okay. Boom. It's going to hit you anyway. You see, what we need is forgiveness that covers. We need something to come upon our sin in our life to make it, listen to me now, as if it never happened. We need something to come in and hit the rewind button and just make it like, like when we were living, we never sinned at all. Now, number one, I can't do that. And God's the only one he, who can. And yes, he can. But at what price? Isaiah the great prophet in the Old Testament in chapter 1, verse 18, said, come, let us reason together. Let's think about this. Now, we, we've been talking about the mind for the last few weeks. And we, we just said this, that mind equals thinking plus feeling. Thinking creates a feeling plus choices. So thinking creates a feeling that leads us to make a choice. Come, let's think about this. Let's reason it out together. Though your sins are as scarlet, they shall be made as white as snow. Yes. Though they are red like crimson, they will be as wool. White. Who can do that? Only God. At what price? Look in uh, Romans chapter 5. Begin reading with me. Let's look at verse number 6. For when we were still sinners, when you fall into a sinful state, you stay in that sinful state. You can wake up one day and say, I, I, that was wrong. I shouldn't do it. I, I'll never do that again. How many times have we said that? And then repeated it over again. You see the same thing in our life. There, there are some things, there are some sins that I have put in the rearview mirror. There are some things that I've said that is wrong, that I, I don't want to ever do that again. <clears throat> and I've walked away from that. But you know what? I found something else. When we were still sinners without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Let me read to you out of the CSB. <clears throat> it says this. For while we were still helpless. Helpless. It also uses the word powerless. We had no power to change it. We remained. We were still without hope. We were helpless. Here he says, without strength. In due time, I want to say at the right time, at God's time, Christ died for the ungodly. I like the term Christ there. It means the Messiah. It means the anointed one. He was anointed for this cause. It was his joy. It was his duty. It was what led him to come to earth. He came for no other reason than your sin and my sin. He saw us in our need even before we committed the sin. And said, I will go take care of that. Look what he says. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. I would hope to think that I would be that person. Y'all see on the news this week the one who just ran into the store and just began to shoot people randomly. 
I would hope to think, I don't know because I haven't experienced it, but I would hope to think that if someone came in and everyone was in harm's way, that I would be big enough to stand in the way of someone who was there and, and, and I would take it so that they wouldn't have to. But if the police or somebody was there and they pointed the gun at that person, I doubt I would run and stand in front of them and take their bullet. Maybe for a righteous person. Scarcely for a good person. But could you think about the person, I don't know how to say it, worthless in our eyes, a criminal in our eyes? I don't, I know we all have our own view of sin. And though there is no big sin and there's no little sin, there are some sins that I look at today and I cringe. For me, it's when someone takes and does something to a, a small child, a defenseless child, and does all kinds of evil to that child. There are times that I, and, and I, I, well, actually, I don't apologize because it's how I feel. I wish I felt better about it. But I, sometimes I'd like just to get a committee from the church and that's, just let us go handle it. I think we'd have some people volunteer, you know. We, we would be one of those churches where we laid hands on people. Amen? I mean, there's just sometimes you just look at it and you just think, how could you do that to such a child? I mean, I would, I, maybe if, if someone came in here, my wife were up there, I would stand in the way because I love her and she's precious to me. And I would not want anything bad to happen to her. But for the one who, who would do such vile things, just the overflow from an evil heart, would you do it for them? But yet, look what it says in verse 8. But God demonstrates His own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It's not like I can go to God and say, would you look at my resume? I'm a pretty good guy. Look at all the things that I've done. Lord, I surrender to your ministry. Look at all the sermons that I preached, all the prayers that I prayed, all the times that I studied, all the times that I served. Look at all that I did for you, oh God. You should be so proud of me. Mark just sang about it. We start thinking about all the things that we've done. God saw a need and God was willing to go much beyond what I could ever do. God, listen to this in the CSB. It says, but God proves his own love toward us. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still sinners, sinners he proved it he didn't just talk about it he did something about it and the word love means to to see and to value and to cherish and because you find great treasure in it listen to me now you're willing to put yourself under it so that the great benefit could be to them it's not what you get out of it but what you can do for them because you love them, because you treasure them, because you cherish them. When God looked at us, and, and one of the things that, that keeps us from God is we look at our sin and we call it everything else other than the dirty, rotten thing that it is. Oh, it's just a little, just a little hiccup, just a little setback, just a little shortcoming. It's all the holy God who is just and real and right and good said that will make it where you cannot spend your eternity with me. And I don't want it that way. Take your Bible. Flip over in the Old Testament to Isaiah. This time let's look in chapter 53. Isaiah 53. I don't know of a scripture most definitely in the Old Testament. But in all the scriptures, I don't know of a, a, a particular place in one concise place that talks about how unworthy we are 
and yet how Jesus would come to take the place of guilty sinners. Let's look at God's Word today. Who has believed our report? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant. Jesus didn't come as the mature oak. He didn't come as the finished product. He didn't come as all that. He came as a child of poverty in Bethlehem who grew up in a rejected city called Nazareth, who humbled himself. He came as a tender plant, as a root out of dry ground. Israel, Rome, the world was a very bleak, dark, ugly place at that time. He has no form Or comeliness, the new King James said. And when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. The only one who ever got to choose how they looked was the creator God. But he didn't come. When he chose the body that he would take, it was not the most beautiful. It was actually just very normal. In our land today, we value beauty very much. We We look at people and we say, that is a beautiful person. People pay unbelievable amounts of money to certain people who will advertise their product simply because of their fame or their beauty. Jesus came from heaven, but he didn't take on the form of this great magnetic personality of of, of will, this person of beauty. He was just very, can I say, average. Verse 3, when he talks of his ministry, he is despised, rejected by men. Think about that word, despised. That's a very strong word. But the one who came to minister to others, to love others, to be kind to others. He even had a group of people who wanted to kill him because he healed someone on the Sabbath day. He did a good thing, but he didn't do it in a way that they approved of it. Because of that, they despised him. He was a man of sorrows. He was acquainted with grief. Look at the end of verse 3. And we hid as it were our faces from him. Church, listen to me. If you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and Lord, you do not have the privilege of thinking little of Christ. If he is your Savior, your Lord, your Master, your King, you can think little of me, but please don't think little of him. You can ignore, just don't ignore him. If there's ever a day, can I, forgive me for using such an illustration, but is there ever a time that we think of God and go, y'all hear me? But that's really what he is saying there. They hid their faces from him. They had no thought of him. He was despised. We did not esteem him. Listen to verse 4. Surely he is born. That means he, he was placed upon him. He, he is born our grief. He's carried our sorrow. Yet we esteemed him stricken. Smitten by God. Here's the word. He was afflicted. What they did to him. He was wounded for our transgressions. But God demonstrated his love for us and that while we were still sinners, yet sinners, Christ died 
for us. He was wounded for my sins, my transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. He left Shalom God, left the heaven of peace. The word peace means two sides, diametrically opposed or brought together. But when he left heaven, they were no longer one with God. He was separated from God. On the cross of Calvary, God had to turn his back upon him because he became my sin. By his stripes, we are healed. When the chief priest of the Jewish people took Jesus and they asked him, are you the Christ? He could not turn it down. He said, it is as you say. By the way, when they took him to Pilate, Pilate asked the same thing. And in the same way, Jesus replied, he told the truth. But when the Jewish people did that, they laughed at him and they mocked him and they struck him and said, prophesy, who hit you? And they spat in his face. When they took him to Pilate, Pilate said, what do you want me to do? We want you to convict him. Why? What has he done? Crucify him. What has he done deserving of death? Hear, hear Pilate's words. I find no fault in him. Pilate's wife came to him and said, Please leave this man alone. I have suffered many things in dreams because of him. But because of his fear of the people. But Pilate wanted to do something to appease them. So he sent him to be crucified. But before that, he gave him over to his soldiers. And they stripped him of his clothes. They put a crown of thorns upon his head. They beat him with rods. They took him out. And they tied him to a pole. And a Roman soldier, skilled in doing this, took what it was called a cat of nine tails. Nine strips, strips of leather, all tied together with a handle. And on each of the strips of leather, there were tied to it pieces of stick and rock or glass. And they would take that whip, nine leathers, and they would come and whip him. It would hit his side and wrap around the pole and hit him on the back. And as it did, he would pull back on it like a fisherman who, who sets the hook in a fish and sets it. So it would whip him. And as he pulled it back to himself, it would literally just pull the meat off of his back. And they didn't give him just one stripe, not two, five, ten, forty stripes minus one because they said forty stripes would kill him. And they didn't want to kill him because they were going to crucify him in just a few moments. Isaiah says in the 51st chapter, his visage was so marred. He was beaten and bruised so much that you could not even look at him and recognize him. But I said all that to say this. That was my punishment he took. It was my sorrow. The chastisement of my sin was placed upon him. I was the one guilty of sin. But so there could be forgiveness. The penalty had to be paid. And life is in the blood. A sacrifice had to be given. And it had to be a pure sacrifice. A spotless lamb. Verse 6. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We've wandered off in sin. We may have not even realized it. I like the term about a sinner when we say they're lost, they've lost the path, they've lost their way. Now they're condemned because they can't find their way back. 
We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord God has laid on him, Jesus, the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed. He was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He could have said, leave me alone. He could have said, I'm innocent. I don't deserve this. He could have called 10,000 angels and they could have come down and taken him from the cross. He could have judged us in our sin because we deserve it. But he loved, cherished, valued us and put us higher than him. Look in verse 7. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter. And as his sheep before his shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Are y'all looking? A priest would take that lamb and hold it up here to his chest. The head would be facing away. The feet would be facing away. He would hold it up against him and take a knife and reach around it and cut its throat. And as he held it, and as the blood came down, he could feel the beating of the heart in the lamb, and then it would stop. The life that was given, he was led as a lamb to the slaughter, but he never stopped it. He followed through with it. Verse 8, he was taken from prison. Pilate held him in prison from judgment where Pilate had him on trial. Who will declare his generation? He was cut off from the land of the living. He gave his life for the transgressions of my people. He was stricken. When they made his grave with the wicked, he had a thief on both sides. But with the rich at his death, Joseph of Arimathea came and asked for his body. Nicodemus brought a hundred pounds of ointment to anoint his body. And they put him in a tomb where no one had ever been laid before. Because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. That's why Joseph did it. Nicodemus did it. Even the centurion that stood at the cross, when they saw him there, he said, surely this is the Son of God. When he heard Jesus say those words, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. When they heard Jesus tenderly take care of his mom, and make sure that John would be there for her. When the, when, the, when the one on his right hand, dying for his sin, said, remember me when you enter your paradise. Jesus knew his purpose in coming and turned and cared for him. Today we will be with me in paradise. The centurion was so struck that all he saw from this one was love. We should be so struck that all that we see when we look at Christ is His love for us. When you make His soul, excuse me, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise Him, verse 10. It pleased the Lord. Literally, God said, this is right. It's a high price. For God so loved the world that he gave, can I say this? Freely gave, willingly gave his only begotten son. That whosoever, I guess that's us, believeth in him, we don't have to be judged and, and perish. We can have everlasting life. Joyful life whole life, complete life. It pleased the Lord to bruise him. 
He, God, has put him, Jesus, to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days. The pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. I love this, the pleasure of the Lord. He's called the Christ, the anointed one. That literally means when that 10-year-old boy walked down the aisle and got down on his knees and confessed his sin that he knew that he had and cried out to God and said, Lord, I believe that you died on the cross of Calvary for me. Come into my heart. Forgive me. Save me. God reached down from glory and touched that little boy. It made me whole. And I have never been the same. I will never be the same because God loved me all the way home. The pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. One day I'm going to look at him face to face. And when I look at Jesus, I'll see a smile there. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many. He shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great. He shall divide the spoil with the strong. Why? Because he poured out his soul unto death. He was numbered with the transgressors, the thieves on the cross. And he bore the sins of many, which mine included. He made intercession for the transgressors. I, I read the Gospels this week. I always do before what we call Passion Week. And in all four of the accounts, of the Gospels. It talks about what they did to him on the cross. No greater love. Deborah bought this picture for us. When you think of how they just laid him on that cross and nailed him there, they would literally have to put ropes around their arm to keep them from pulling back but not our Lord. That was his purpose. I wonder what his face looked like when he looked over at the one who was driving the spike in his hand. You think it was a, a look of love? A look of love? When we think about the cross, sometimes we think about him way up on the cross and everybody having to look up. But literally what they would do when they nailed him there, they would pick him up and drop him down in a hole. And his feet would be no more than 12, maybe 18 inches over the ground. But he wasn't hanging like this. He was pulled down by gravity. He was tired and weary. He, he would have been beaten to a pulp. And he would have to push up just to get a breath. And he would fall back down. And they came up. They pulled his beard out of his face. They spat in his face. They mocked him. But he would only look, listen to me now, with love. They nailed him to the cross at 9 o'clock in the morning. And at 12 o'clock, heaven had seen enough. It was not an eclipse. It was not a sandstorm as some liberal theologian would say. Heaven could not look upon it and the skies became black. The sun did not shine because he became my sin. He bore my sin. And God took his, turned his back because God cannot look at sin. And Jesus, who became my sin, was separated from God. That's what took him to his knees in the Garden of Gethsemane where he would say, Lord, if there's any way this cup can pass from me, nevertheless, not my will, thy will be done. It was worth it for him. Salvation was the only way. A sacrifice had to be given. Blood had to be shared, shed. We needed it so very much. And he willingly gave it. 
no greater love. Scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good one. But God demonstrates His love toward us in that while we were what? Still sinners. In all my years of ministry, the one thing that's dumbfounded me the most is for people to know and say they believe in God. I've even heard them say, yes, I believe in Jesus. But yet, we're not willing to receive the gift that He so lovingly gave. For some reason, they would choose the path, their thoughts, their way. They would end up separating them from God forevermore. Yet God doesn't force someone to be saved. God doesn't force them to go to heaven. He just simply gives the opportunity. He simply makes it possible. And aren't you grateful that He did? Can I talk to the church for just a second? We've been talking for the last two weeks. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. You ever heard of the saying, give someone a hand? That's exactly what Christ did for us. He freely gave a hand. And we're supposed to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And because we cherish God, because we love God, because we find a value in Him that cannot be compared with anything else, we're supposed to love others the way that we are loved. And I wonder, in, as we walk through this earth, do we reach out our hands so that someone will give, our, give to us? Or do we reach out our hands so that we can serve others? If you don't know Jesus Christ, take the hand of the Lord Jesus. But if you do know Jesus Christ, give the hand, your hand, that's been touched by the Lord Jesus.